Okay, good evening and good afternoon, beautiful people. Welcome to Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. I'm in the presence of a very special guest with us. Her name is Raylan Connell. She is a professor emerita at the University of Sydney where she obtained her PhD. She is a pioneer in the field of gender studies and is widely known for the concept of hegemonic masculinity and is the author of Southern Theory, Masculinities, The Men and the Boys, Gender and Power, amongst other numerous books and publications. I have a few right here with me. Cool. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can see them, but Gender and Power and the Men and the Boys. And I have Masculinities on ebook on my computer and a couple of cool. your other books as well. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Yes, I, I am glad that you accepted that invitation so graciously. And um, our audience will learn so much today, including myself. Uh, we do have a 16-hour time difference, which is kind of cool because I can say that I'm talking to someone in another day. <laughs> yes, that's exactly across, right. Across the globe, I'm here in Tennessee, and Ray was in Australia right now in Sydney. And just to give an advertisement to my listeners, um, this forum is available on most podcasts and platforms. We're on Apple, Anchor, Anchor Spotify, Radio Public, Popeye. We're all over the place on the internet, and we really try to educate the public on important social issues. And today we're gonna to talk a lot about gender. Um, we may talk about sexuality as well. We talk about, uh, these are topics that come up a lot in the mainstream media in particular, but I think my audience um, sort of needs to learn a little bit more about it, sort of get away from the television and the mainstream frenzy, mm -hmm. and actually get information from the expert herself. So again, thank you again for agreeing. And I guess my first question for you would be, um, did you come up with the term hegemonic masculinity? And if so, how did that come about? Mm. Yeah, I think I probably did. <laughs> um, the, there were similar ideas floating around at the time, um, but I had uh, a couple of reasons for, for coming up with that term. Um, at the time, I was um, involved with a, a small group of researchers doing stuff uh, about social inequality in Australian schools, uh, particularly high schools. We were interviewing, you know, 14 and 15 year old kids, boys and girls, um, and their teachers and their mothers and fathers. <laughs> and their school principals, so we were getting a comprehensive picture of what their lives were like. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that became obvious, um, you know, we were doing this in, in working class schools, and we were also doing it in very privileged schools to get that kind of contrast. Um, one of the things that, that became obvious as we really got our information organised over several years, it took a number of years to do this properly, um, was that gender mattered in the lives of teenage kids. I mean, we weren't much doubt about that, I guess, but we, we came to see more, more directly just how and how kids were involved in constructing, you know, making positions for themselves in a, a gendered world where differences between boys and girls, men and women mattered and where authority was mostly in the hands of men and, uh, you know, girls and women tended to adapt themselves to the kind of situation they were put in when, when men ruled the roost. Um, and we also became very much aware of differences in the ways that uh, different boys, different girls handled these, these issues and, and located themselves in the world. Um, and we became, uh, we became aware, I guess, especially um, of kind of hierarchies among boys um, in, in the school context, in the peer group context, in neighbourhoods and so forth, where some you know, seem to be the top dogs, um, you know, respected by the other kids. Other kids wanted to be like them or be liked by them. <laughs> um, and, and other groups of boys were sort of pushed to the margins and sometimes bullied. Um, and, and this, you, you know, seemed to be 
persistent, it took different shape, but you could see it again in school after school. So we were working, I think, in about eight school, different schools in that, uh, that study. So my, my colleagues and I were thinking, you know, seeing this pop up, this pattern pop up repeatedly. Um, and I was, you know, I'd also been involved in other, um, in other research, for instance, on, on social class and uh, class relations in, in Australia too. And I'd um, been reading and getting ideas from the work of an Italian theorist, Antonio Gramsci, mm -hmm. a really interesting revolutionary, you know, from back in the 1920s and 30s, um, but who sort of pioneered a way of thinking about um, you know, inequalities in, in, in the world, uh, which paid attention to how um, inequalities and privileges and, and marginalisation and so forth was sort of authorised by culture so that you got, you know, people believing just through the way they understood the world, the way they talked about the world, the kind of concepts in their heads, um, people came, might come to believe that, that, that these inequalities were legitimate, you, you know, that people at the top deserved to be at the top and so mm. forth. And I thought, you know, this is, this is fairly well understood in terms of class and maybe a, a bit in terms of race and racism. Um, it also applies to gender. I mean, we're looking at it in these schools in a uh -huh. way um, because the, the boys who are top dog in their peer group, you know, the, the other, I mean, many of the other boys didn't resent that. They thought it was right. They wanted to be like the, the top dog boys or they thought it was right that they should be on top. And it was right that boys who were, you know, a bit effeminate or, um, you know, um, could be regarded as, you know, didn't play football, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, they, they thought it was right that, that they should be, you know, shat upon from a great height. Um, and, um, and so the, this notion of hegemony seemed to make sense, uh, as it did in class relations. It's something like that seemed to be going on in gender too. Um, so that was when we began to call this... Um, you know, the, the top dog group, if you like, hegemonic mm -hmm. masculinity, or the, the, the kind of masculinity they were, they were showing, uh, and which was usually supported by the school, you know, the, you know how, you know, the good footballers or the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the popular kids, you know, get to be school captain or class speaker or whatever it may mm -hmm. be. Um, and, um, you know, it turns out that adults have very similar ideas too because oh, yeah. <laughs> process they grow up, they think that certain kinds of masculinity are admirable and others are bad. Um, so you get that kind of pattern of, of hegemony and marginalisation in adult life too. And once, you know, once we pick that up and sort of given it a name and begun to think about how it worked, um, it did, you know, make sense in a lot of different forums. Uh, made sense in business, for instance, where certain kinds of men seem to get to the top in business, and you know, they're the the, the tough guys, the, the go getters, the ruthless ones, mm -hmm. ones who don't care what happens to the those who are pushed aside in the competition. So there's a kind of hegemonic masculinity there too, which may not be exactly the same as what's hegemonic in a, in a given high school, uh, but it's got something in common. Um, and similarly, you know, in the media, I mean, what, what's Hollywood giving us all the time? But, you know, masculine heroes who are popular with women, handsome, upstanding, willing to pull out the six shooter and plug the bad guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can see it in me. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, so this is where the idea came from. And um, what, what time period is that? Oh, this is, we were doing this in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Okay. So the, I, I think the first time we actually wrote down the term uh, hegemonic masculinity was in a, um, 
a booklet about gender in schools that we made for teachers uh, around 1982. Um, and then uh, because I was working with a couple of, of gay colleagues on um, gender theory and, and understanding masculinities and, and gender, uh, how gender connected with sexuality too, sexual identity, sexual um, relationships, um, uh, we decided to, to try and formalise all of this and wrote a... Uh, an academic paper that, that you will have seen called Towards a New Sociology of Masculinities. Mm -hmm. um, so that was written by the three three guys working on that on that project, and um, and that um, that uh, paper sort of went viral. Um, it it really you know got around um, got around internationally too. So it was translated into German a year or two later and and so it was read in in, in people uh, in, in Latin America uh, began reading it and that uh, fed into some debates that were going on about machismo in Latin America. Um, so yeah that that's how it sort of got into that that concept of hegemonic masculinity began to circulate. I appreciate the explanation. My audience definitely appreciates it because as I was telling you over the email, we have quite a diverse um, group of people listening to this. And sure. um, and I think that they would definitely appreciate that explanation because a lot of these people don't come from um, educational backgrounds. And so sure. Sure. and that's kind of the point is to um, even terms like Global South that we will get into in a minute. I, just, yeah, sure. I think a lot of people just don't know what those terms are. And so it's mm -hmm. good that we get the clarification. Uh, yeah. Before we get into the types of masculinities, um, you just mentioned hegemonic, which is, um, I guess, is the most um, prevalent traditional predominant form that we see across cultures. When we talk about this idea of, um, of a patriarchy or that's what people think of, I think, when they think of power and control and masculinities they think of this common type of masculinity that you brought up but um i wanted to think about the history of men's studies and masculinities mm -hmm. um first of all is are those two interchangeable can you use men's studies and masculinities interchangeably not exactly look before we go into that can i can i feed in a couple of points uh, about this the um what I was calling hegemonic masculinity is by no means necessarily the commonest uh, pattern of masculinity that you'll find. I mean, it is the, if you like, the most admired in a given context. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily the commonest. I mean, a, a lot of men, a lot of boys for that matter, you know, might think that this is, in fact, the, the finest kind of masculinity, but it isn't their own. Um, so, you know... Um, you, you um, uh, that I, I think is really quite important that there are multiple forms of masculinity in the real world in any setting you like to look at, you know, in your country, my country, in India, um, you know, across South America, in Russia, <laughs> um, you will find a whole stack of different kinds of masculinity. You find them in a given school. There'll be different patterns mm -hmm. of masculinity floating around. There'll usually be some hierarchy among them, and, um, and so you can often speak of a hegemonic form. But that is not necessarily the most traditional. So, you know, the situations change. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, technology changes, the economy changes, people get unemployed. You know, other groups come, you know, go make a billion dollars and so forth. So the pattern of what's hegemonic may also change over time. And that's both troubling. I mean, it's a bit of a problem that, that new, you know, top dogs will emerge, like mm -hmm. the tech mavens who've, who've become billionaires because of our, you know, crazy economic system. Um, <laughs> yeah. But also the fact that there are different kinds of masculinity and different, uh, you know, differences emerge over time. It gives a lot of room for optimism. 
you know, that, that maybe violence, you know, isn't, you know, a, a permanent part of, of any admired kind of masculinity, maybe more egalitarian, maybe more justice oriented masculinities, which can also be tough stuff, um, that might conceivably become hegemonic in the future. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's something you know to to hope for. Anyway, coming back to your your question about um, men's studies and masculinity uh, research, it's a little bit tangled. Um, I mean, the, the whole field really um, came into existence as a you know a, a, a well defined you know field of research and and policy discussion and. It, indeed media discussion, in the wake of the women's liberation movement. And back in around the early 70s, when, when the women's movement was becoming stronger, countries like the United States, there were groups of men who thought, yeah, this, um, this is good for women, for sure, but it's also good for men, because uh, it's taking off men the uh, the burdens of you know trying to maintain inequality and you know keep women down and so forth. Mm. So a little men, men's liberation movement sprung up, uh, which at that time was thought of as you know supporting women's liberation, supporting the women's movement. And that that was so for maybe five, maybe eight years or something like that. But also among other groups of men, um, there was a backlash against the women's movement um, and an attempt to reassert what were thought of, not necessarily accurately, but what were thought of as traditional gender arrangements. Men on top, nuclear families, uh, no gay stuff, you know, um, uh, all of this. So there was a kind of backlash movement too. And when when women's studies got established in in the universities, which it was doing in the United States around the mid mid 1970s, there was an attempt to create a field called men's studies in parallel. Okay, women were having their turn. Somehow men needed their turn too in their own field of study. And this, you can see this was a little bit ambivalent. <laughs> you could wonder which way would this turn? Would this you know, actually produce more equality in, in our lives? Uh, or would it reinstate you know, some kind of notion that gender inequalities were, were forever? Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it's the notion of men's studies has retained that kind of ambivalence that mixed character ever since uh, which is one reason I don't use the term myself uh, much um, it it leads some people uh, I guess to think that you can understand men's lives quite separately from women's lives so there's a bit of you know putting men in a box over here on the left side and Women in a box over here on the right mm -hmm. side. You can study them separately and 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 understand them separately. And I'm very critical of that approach, wherever it comes from. Um, so you know, I argue that what we actually most need to understand is the connections, uh, the gender yeah. relations, um, and and men's and women's uh, gendered lives make sense because of the pattern of connections only for uh, only makes sense that way um, so that's I think um, why I'm more inclined to say look the basic concept is one about gender relations within that we can study you know masculinities we can study femininities we can study patterns of men's lives patterns of women's lives within in relation to each other that's really important um, so that's what i'd say about the the terminology if you like women's the term women's studies made a bit more sense i think because in the 70s 
men very much control academic life. Um, and, and most of the disciplines um, in universities, um, you know, were invented by men and embedded men's perspective on the world, or at least influential men's perspective on the world, um, and, um, and took very little account of women and women's experience in women's lives. That, that critique was correct. That was the case in, um, you know, uh, traditional forms of where I think the term tradition does apply, um, traditional forms of, of academic study. And women's studies was invented as a, a kind of critique of that, you know, patriarchal mm -hmm. academic world and saying, hey, we're here too, you know, half the human race is being missed out in your academic disciplines. Pay attention to women, study women, and bring women into the academic picture. Mm -hmm. And that was the message of, of women's studies. Now, the term women's studies is, is less used now than it was then. Um, people are now more inclined to call you know, a department or a program or a journal or some gender studies, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't mean just women plus men, but also gender relations uh, in, in different societies, in different contexts and so forth. Um, and usually also tries to connect uh, sexuality research with gender research, which is really quite an important connection. And, and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so that language of, of gender studies is now much the commonest uh, across the academic world in the United States, certainly, but also uh, more widely. Okay, so we, we discussed earlier some about hegemonic masculinity, but there were three other ones that when I was doing my dissertation and I was kind of introducing like these topics, um, I had a, a harder time sort of differentiating between um, marginalized and subordinate masculinities. Mm -hmm. I, um, complicit made a little bit more sense, like after reading into hegemonic masculinity, but marginalized and subordinate, I had a hard time differentiating the two. Can you kind of explain what that's about? Sure. Um Look, I, I don't think these terms should be fixed. Um, right. Okay. Right. Uh, you, you know, when, when in such our social analysis, we we learn new things, we you know reconsider old concepts, and and maybe we can do better. Um, so I wouldn't, you, you know, I wouldn't go on the barricades to defend these terms. Right. Right. Uh, right. When, when when I introduced them, the idea was that um, what I called subordinate masculinities were in in the mainstream Australian context in right? Mascul if for instance the, the masculinities of effeminate men and gay men who are often uh, sometimes uh, quite wrongly uh, you know assumed to, to be effeminate um, that is people who were subordinated to you know the hegemonic group mainly in gender terms uh, because their pattern of masculinity was presumed to be like women, like women, uh, so if you know effeminate in some way. What I called marginalized masculinities were masculine. There, I was bringing in, uh, you know, before the term uh, became popular, uh, a kind of you know idea of intersectionality. I was thinking there, you know, you can have um, patterns of masculinity which are distinct from the socially hegemonic form largely because someone for instance belonged to a different ethnic group or a different racialized group so in, in Australia that might mean indigenous men uh, it might mean non-anglo migrants who were an important part of the Australian population um, and if you took it into other um, uh, social context, you might think about the construction of masculinity among black men in a white-dominated society. 
Um, that, that, that was why I used the two different terms, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you may or may not find that distinction a useful one because people are now much more familiar with the idea of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps that concept of, of marginalised masculinity is not much, it's not particularly helpful now. Um, uh, because we can see, you know, other things going on in the intersectional space. Um, so, you know, since since those categories were were developed in the um, in the 80, 1980s, um, there have been proposals about you know new concepts we need. Um, the the one that I find most interesting, most helpful, um, is the idea of, of hybrid masculinities. Um, that is, you can see situations where um, groups of men or boys um, seem to be drawing, you know, for their um, sense of their selves, their their way of acting, their repertoire, if you like, of, mm -hmm. of, of acting in the world, their relationships with, with other boys and with, with girls, they seem to be drawing on, on several different forms of masculinity as you might have seen them in, in a previous generation and so are constructing something new that, that mm -hmm. um, in, in, by some researchers is, is being called hybrid masculinity. As you can see some of those kinds of things. If you remember the TV program Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, yes, yes, saw a little bit of that hybridization going on, mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, uh, it, it, it's something you know where uh, queer identities, so forth, are becoming a little more popular among young people now. Maybe there's a kind of hybridization going on there too. Mm. Yeah, I. I have a strong interest in this topic because I deal with uh, Black men in Latin American literature, specifically mm -hmm. Black men, but I also deal with women, Indigenous people, as well as LGBTQIA. So I, I do have several interests, but Black men would be, I guess, my primary area of research. And mm -hmm. I had such a frustration when I was finishing my dissertation because there seems to be a lack of scholarship when when it pertains to black men in the Americas, um, mm -hmm. especially Latin America, there's a little bit more in the United States, but in Latin America, there's a there's such a gap of scholarship, I think that's still developing um, with the intersectionality of race and uh, masculinities. It, is that changing at all? Because I know you've done some research that's um, given some shine to the global South and that, um, phenomenon has been kind of ignored over the years um, and you bring that to light in your book The Southern Theory. You talk about mm -hmm. how um, these colonized peoples, you know, they have a history too. They have a sure formation thing. too and so but we get this Anglo-centered view of masculinities and it sort of just diffuses everywhere else. Yep, that's, that's absolutely right uh, and it's the way actually the that uh, the whole academic world basically works. Uh, you know, it's it's something that I talk about as a, a kind of global economy of knowledge, just like we have the material economy where the global south, you know, serves the corporations, the transnational corporations as a kind of mm -hmm. gigantic mine for minerals and raw materials and genetically engineered soybeans <laughs> and oil and coffee oh, yeah. and God knows what. Okay, you know, all of this story. And um, so there's a, a massive material trade where the raw materials from the global south, you know, get transferred to the more privileged, the, the old imperial powers of the global north. Same sort of thing happens in the world of knowledge, um, though it's less noticed, I think. Um, or less debated until very recently. Um, 
<clears throat> so and there's a brilliant philosopher from, from Benin in West Africa, a guy called Paulin Huntonji, uh, who diagnosed this pattern better than anyone else. A, a great admiration for his work. Um, and he, uh, he sort of showed how this, this pattern of ine inequality, I mean, it is really a deeply unequal flows of data from the global south, but concepts and methods from the global north, um, so that most of the research that's done around the global south, I and mean, when we talk about the global south, we're talking about the majority world. And we're not mm -hmm. talking about a small periphery. We're talking about six out of seven of the whole world's population <laughs> live mm -hmm. outside Europe and North America. Um, so, you know, um, this is where most things happen. Um, and, uh, but the people who are researching in these areas, whether they're researching the national natural sciences or social sciences or humanities, um, still mostly are oriented to ideas and methods that come from the global north, you know, mm -hmm. from Harvard and Princeton and Berkeley and Michigan and Oxford and Cambridge and mm -hmm. Heidelberg and Berlin, uh, you know, the, the elite institutions, knowledge institutions of the global north and the journals they publish and the conferences they convene, you know, <clears throat> their theories and methods you know, are hegemonic, to use that term again, mm -hmm. in the academic world. And most people who work elsewhere, whether it's in Latin America or India or Australia or Japan or China, um, you know, are working in that, that kind of frame of reference. Um, now, that affects masculinities research, of course, uh, as it affects everywhere. Um, so if you read, you know, Latin American or Indian journals, you will find references to Simone de Beauvoir, Judith Butler, John Scott, mm -hmm. the, you know, the heroines of gender studies in the global north, um, and rightly so. I mean, there's, there's, there's important stuff, of course, in, in their work. Um, but you won't find much reference to theory that comes from other parts of the global south. Um, and, and sometimes you won't find reference to any theory at all, any concepts mm. at all that come from the global south. It's just sort of cloning uh, research methods and concepts that have come from the global north. Now, that, that really is a problem because, you know, the histories of, of these parts of the world are different. Colonisation, for one thing, um, the, the cultural traditions are different, religion, re, religious configuration is different in a variety of ways. Uh, the demography is different, the economies are different. Uh, of course, you know, gender relations are going to, to be different in a variety of ways. Um, and therefore it is really important um, that, you know, <clears throat> these regions should not just produce data which is funneled into the, the knowledge machinery of the elite institutions of the global north, but should produce their own thinking and concepts about this. Now, this is happening. Um, mm -hmm. This does happen. Um, and, you know, taking the case you mentioned of the, uh, uh, you know, research on masculinities, I and mean, people like Mara Viveros, whose work I'm sure you know in Colombia, Mm -hmm. uh, it's done brilliant work on masculinities, including black masculinities, in a post-colonial context. Uh, that's that's wonderful work. I've immense respect for her work. You find, uh, you know, significant work on indigenous masculinities and femininities and cultures in in Central America, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, you find, you know, increasing amount in in Brazil, though heaven knows, you know, academic life in Brazil has been you know, pretty pressured and, and difficult recently. Um, and, of course, also in Africa. Um, so we have, you, you know, terrific researchers doing work with black men. Uh, for instance, Kopana Ratele in South Africa, a psychologist from South Africa, has written mm -hmm. great stuff. Um, and um, 
can I mention as a little, uh, uh, to give a little advertisement here, Kupana has just uh, written another book, uh, which is called Why Men Hurt Women. Mm. Uh, and it's a collection of, of studies. It's written for a wider audience, not an academic book, uh, but it's about question, you know, it takes off from questions of gender-based violence mm. um, from a point of view that's trying to understand the situation of, of men and, uh, and particularly black men in, in the majority communities in, in South Africa um, and, and wrestle with the, the questions of how do we overcome, you know, patterns of, of gender-based violence. It's a great book. Uh, it's, it's really terrific stuff. Uh, and Copano's wider work is, is really quite important for this field. Um, for instance, you know, uh, when you hear, you know, right-wing politicians raving on about, um, about gender issues uh, in both Australia and the United States, uh, you'll hear them constantly saying, you know, our traditions are under threat. Well, Copano has asked, what do we actually mean by traditions? And, and let's look into this a bit. And when you look into actual traditions, you find they're pretty complicated. We have multiple traditions in generations. Mm -hmm. uh, some things that are called traditional are actually historically quite recent. You know, like this famous nuclear family, you know, mum, dad, two kids, a dog, white picket fence, mm. and two cars in the garage. That Very true. Notion, that's supposed to be the traditional family. It's not. It's not. You know, it's not mm -hmm. the majority form of family now. Um, and historically, it's really quite recent. Um, so... Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of misrepresentation about uh, about questions of tradition in, mm. in gender relations, um, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, and and that misrepresentation usually does have a kind of backlash uh, message in it. So that's assuming a hegemonic point of view. There, it is exactly. Mm -hmm. It's trying to impose a hegemonic pattern of masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, when that is, if in situations where that's backed by the media, backed perhaps by uh, many churches, uh, backed by government, um, you know, you can have a pretty powerful effect. Um, so, you know, this is a field of, of context. It's, it's, not, it's not an easy field to work in. Ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know this. I'm sure. Um, it's there's tough stuff here, and 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 really difficult um, political issues, political struggles, as as um, the women's movement uh, well well knows. Something I um, discovered when I was doing my research um, as a PhD student at UT Knoxville was that um, through I, I deal with fiction, primarily fiction. But some would argue that, you know, fiction reflects pretty much nonfiction. And, you know, you can't have fiction without the nonfiction, especially when you're talking about um, some of the Black writers that I deal with. I mean, they're, it's very self-reflexive in ways, um, mm -hmm. in, even in the novels. And just doing some of these novels, you realize that the state is always present. Um, Haiti, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, the government is always so intrusive so overpowering, so coercive, and it leads to this whole idea now that we deal with, with um, it's almost a very conscious promotion of war all the time, and the state is really the gendered institution. I try to tell my friends all Absolutely. the time that the yeah. state is a gendered institution, and so it always gives the, the auspice of promoting the wars because it wants you to think that the war is the right thing to do, but it's a very much a gender type of mindset. And people, sure. and it's easy for people to sort of attest themselves to that uh, mindset. How do we combat those types of ways of thinking? Because I, I posed this question because I saw an interview where you talked about uh, sort of redirecting 
this violent sort of approach to masculinity to more um, of an egocentric, I guess, but not, but but less emphasis on the violence, you know, anything but the violence. Yeah. Look, uh, uh, what you're talking about there has, has been really important. I mean, one of the ways that, you know, military forces have, have held together, um, given how horrible war actually is, um, when you're in it, um, not, not many people except psychopaths are enjoying themselves, um, let alone, you know, being blown apart, um, the chance of being blown apart. Um, how, how on earth do governments and, and armies hold themselves together? Well, one of the ways is through the politics of masculinity, by trying to convince men that this is the only way to be a real man. Um, so in my, in my book, Masculinities, mm -hmm. um, the first, first edition of that came out, what was it, 20, 25 years ago? A bit, bit more than that. 95, um, yeah. I, I had uh, some, Ill, I, I, I was rather proud of, of my illustrations uh, about you know, different patterns of masculinity. And one of the illustrations was a recruiting poster for the US Army mm -hmm. in World War I. Um, and you know, it said quite explicitly, the US Army builds men. And here was this heroic white guy you know, more or less a knight in shining armor. Oh, yeah. There's great these fine men who are being sent shipped off to the trenches in World War I being blown to pieces by artillery. I mean, the whole thing is just like the ironies and, you know, uh, the, the ruthlessness of it, you know, is it, it, just appalling. Um, look, I think how to get a grip on this, of course, is, is difficult. I mean, the Russian regime is doing this right now. Uh, yeah. Their yeah. attack on, on, uh, um, uh, on Ukraine. Um, the, so it, it's, it's an active kind of process, even though it's not quite as gross uh, as it was in World War I. Um, I think it's absolutely first of the first importance that we should have alternative ways of being a man. We should have positive alternatives to offer, not just say, you know, violence is bad, but say, look, there's a way of being a man um, that, that matters to other people, that is nonviolent, it has its difficulties, it needs maybe bravery and determination, all right, um, but it doesn't consist of beating up uh, women or other men. Um, and uh, there, there are such models around, lots of them, actually, um, many men who live nonviolent lives and who should be celebrated for that, I, I, I think. Um, and sometimes you can see, you know, a, a concern to... Uh, to involve men in, in caring for other people, especially vulnerable people, you know, becoming significant. So, for instance, uh, a good many young fathers now are trying to involve themselves in the care of their babies mm -hmm. and their very young children, which used to be, and here I think there is, a, you know, a history, uh, not too long ago, uh, was thought of as exclusively women's business. But men can do it. Of course they can. Um, and um, so we are seeing, I think, significant numbers of young fathers now beginning to take on a greater care role and coming to feel something of the, the, the beautiful bonding and, and the, you know, absolutely fascinating um, and some and very often funny experiences that you have in, in caring for young children. So, you know, we found we've seen therefore in, in for instance in in Brazil, um, I know um, of a, a a program involving young fathers, giving support to young fathers in in care, which has 
you know, been been quite successful in in constructing a a, a, a different model of what it is um, to be masculine, where masculinity doesn't consist of just fathering as many children as you can and then mm. leaving it to women to bring up. Um, but having a hands-on relationship yourself. And I know in, in Mexico there have been discussions about paternidad, excuse my Spanish, bad Spanish accent, paternidad afectiva. I see. Um, emotionally, emotionally engaged fatherhood. Um, so that's one direction that we can look for, for other models. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there are others uh, out there to be found. But having positive alternatives to, to violence, as whether they're individual violence or military violence, uh, seems to me very important. I was, um, you just mentioned the part about Fraternidad Activa in Mexico, and it's funny, I actually have a part two with my friend Ramon Muñiz Sarmiento. He's actually a Cuban scholar. He lives in the United States now. And in our first interview, we talked about his experience in Cuba growing up during the special period. Um, and now Cuba's going through a lot of economic dire uh, situations right now too. But um, we're, we're going to talk about the new Cuban constitution um, mm -hmm. where the same sex uh, marriage discussion has become a reality in Cuba now. And right. how, and previous to this whole situation, there, there was always a lead up. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about areas like Cuba that are perceived as very uh, um, machista. But mm -hmm. in reality, uh, what I've learned through the people in Cuba and just talking to people over the years is that even for people who are gay and trans in Cuba, if they follow certain rules of conduct and agree with basically what the government says, it's almost um, like no one really focuses on it a whole lot, mm -hmm. but, but it goes into that whole idea again. It's like, if you're on board with the program of the state, then all these identities kind of get pushed to the side and it, and it becomes the vision of whatever the government wants these people to do. And so, mm -hmm. But now we're having a situation where human rights is getting put to the forefront. And so it's interesting to see people sort of wiggling around and changing their minds now when at first they were comfortable because the status quo was intact, but now this is kind of dissolving the status quo. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you'll see direct, you, you know, changes in different directions happening at the same time, um, you know, as, as has happened, I guess, across Latin America where, you know, there have been human rights campaigns, there have been feminist movements, you know, in Latin America, as long as there have been in the, the Anglo world, um, and you know, strong and, and and effective movements too, but you've also had you know an expansion of evangelical churches, often of which uh, some, many of which actually have very conservative, or what they understand to be conservative ideas about mm -hmm. gender relations. Um, so you've got different patterns of. Of, of change and and often conflicts that will result, um, you know that that we can't avoid. Um, but being aware of the, the the diversity, the different patterns of direction, and the possibilities of you know more equal and more humane and caring relationships, to, just knowing those possibilities, I think, is helpful. I had a question about, and just to um, clarify to the audience, what does the Global South encompass? Sure. Well, it's not a very clearly uh, marked out concept. It, look, the term came into use back in the 1970s uh, and, and partly as a result of uh, debates at the United Nations when uh, a number of a uh, considerable number of the, the newly independent countries got together with the former colonies in, in South America, South and Central America, who'd been independent um, politically, um, though still dependent economically often um, for longer 
got together and said, hey, uh, you know, it, it's basically uh, either the United States or the Soviet Union, which is calling the, the shots on economic development. We want our voice heard. They call themselves the Group of 77 because there were 77 um, countries involved in this, um, which itself is an indication that you're dealing with a lot of people. <laughs> we are not dealing with a small margin here, but with the majority of the world's population live outside the superpowers. Um, so uh, that, that, that's when the, uh, the term Global South came to be used in those debates about the Group of 77 and what, what was the other uh, viewpoint that needed to be articulated uh, that wasn't the viewpoint of the United States and its allies or the Soviet Union and its allies. So it had some connection with the old idea of the third world mm -hmm. um, and with attempts like the Bandung Conference in 1955 to, to organise a kind of third perspective in the, in, the cold, in the Cold War. So there weren't just two systems but more. Um, and I guess the term since then has been used in a loose way, sometimes to mean only the poor post-colonial countries, sometimes to mean all the post-colonial countries. Um, and uh, sometimes to include form all the former colonies and some countries that weren't exactly colonized, like China. But we're nevertheless still in, you know, in the same kind of economic situation uh, of of developing from from a very poor base and a very marginalised situation in global politics. Um, China was sort of semi-colonised by, you know, all the imperial powers practically: the British, Germany, the United States, Japan, Russia, mm -hmm. all got all got their knife into China. Um, until the uh, well into the 20th century. Um, so, yeah, Global South is a loose term, um, and I don't think there's much point in trying to make it uh, really sharp, uh, provided you know what, you, you, what issue you're trying to get at at a given time. Yes, and so I had a question about the thing, one of the most frustrating things too, um, dealing with black men, I actually had to come up with parameters to uh, define black masculinities in Latin America. And so I was trying to attempt to do something that hadn't been done previously. And so I came up with five parameters and amongst those parameters were uh, generational traumas, emotive numbness, violence, which um, toxic masculinity being a subset of violence, and contentious relationship with the white female. There's just different aspects that I tried to pinpoint within my research. But a frustrating component that I saw was that I felt like even when it came to sexual identities in particular, um, I didn't see as much as a variance as I wanted to see, in at least in the literature that I was dealing with um, mm -hmm. when it came to black men and sexual identities. Maybe it was just the limitations of the li the literature itself, or maybe those are the restraints that have sort of been imposed on the outside world onto the subject. I don't know which one it is, but um, what do you see in your research when it comes to, um, I guess, marginalized groups and the idea of sexual identities and orientations? Do you see quite a bit of variance? Um, <clears throat> well, Yes, I think I, I think I do actually. <coughs> so you know, if you're thinking, say, you, you, you're working with the idea of gay men in, say, in a country like Australia, take my country. Um, okay, the gay what 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 is generally understood to be the gay community, turns out when you look at it a bit more closely, to be mainly white and mm -hmm. mainly middle class. Now there are other groups of Gay men who may not even call themselves gay, because that term is associated with you know the visible gay community in in the major cities mainly. Mm -hmm. um, but there are men who 
love other men uh, or have sexual relationships with other men uh, in the countryside, uh, in Indigenous communities, in uh, non-English-speaking you know, migrant groups, and in, you know, white Anglo working class, um, which is, you know, somewhat distanced from the visible gay community, mainly on the lines of social class, money. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's those kinds of, um, of, of differences, fairly easy to see. And um, you, uh, you would expect somewhat different patterns of gay masculinity to develop in those, those different contexts. Um, so you might, for instance, find um, you know, men in, in the visible gay community who have you know, decent incomes and um, are you know, in, involved in the bar scene, the venue scene, the nightclub scene, and so on and so forth, to pay more attention to self-presentation in terms of clothes and, and you know, lively conversation and so forth. Uh, whereas, say, working class men who are casually employed, who, who are precarious in employment, can't afford nice clothes, probably can't afford nice medical treatment either, mm -hmm. um, who may be targeted for, for well, any gay men, men conceivably can be targeted for violence, but, but might be more vulnerable to it. Uh, the pattern of masculinity there might look significantly different. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that that's the uh, I would I would look for uh, that uh, that kind of thing. And social research sometimes surveys might pick up some of those differences. Sometimes you'd need kind of ethnographic uh, kind of research. Literature may or may not, you know, represent that diversity, depending on the, uh, you know, novels are sometimes really important, novels and short stories too, uh, are sometimes really important sources of insights into understanding masculinity. It's like, you know, um, you, you know, novels like Richard Wright's or... Um, mm -hmm. Chino Achebe, for instance, is a wonderful book, Things Fall Apart, um, uh, you know, describing the impact of, of colonialism on, you know, Indigenous men in West Africa. It's a terrific book um, and, uh, you know, is a global bestseller in a way. Well, I think that, uh, for one, should be read by everyone with a concern for understanding masculinities mm -hmm. in, in the course of social change, even though it's you know it's now historical. But um, now that a novel is you know of necessity, you know, it's just part, almost part of the genre. You know, picks out specific parts of social reality to to turn the light on a particular. In in the case of, of work on masculinity, particular male characters to to you know describe their consciousness or their their interactions or their conversation you, you can't really avoid doing that mm -hmm. um but looking you know widely enough um you, you, you sh I, I would expect you would find a fair diversity of, of masculinities in in a, a whole genre of literature yeah and, and and that was sort of the homework, and that's why I think um, my research was. I, I'm I'm quite proud of it now. You know, now that I'm out of the program, I ha I've had time to reflect it. But you almost had to be creative about defining the characters in novels, for instance, because they don't just um, clearly define themselves as LGBTQ, for instance. And so we're also talking in a time period, but pre Stonewall. So mm -hmm. we don't even have people who um, they're not even defining themselves that way. So you have to make that decision yourself. Do you have enough information to come to that conclusion? You know, and then you have to argue that conclusion. And so sure. I, I had to do that in my second chapter. And I used um, 
there's a writer, Jafari S. Allen. I've tried to get him to interview. Hopefully I can reach through and get to him. Um, he's got two books out. One is called Vinceremos, uh, The Erotics of Self-Making in Cuba. And the second one he just released last year is called There's a Disco Ball Amongst Us, I think is what it's called. And so it talks a lot about um, the black gay culture in the United States, but he also deals with Cuban uh, men as well, um, black Cuban men. And some of the um, the underworld when it comes to the drag culture in Cuba. Um, so hopefully I can get him on and we can kind of expand that uh, realm when it comes to black men, especially in Latin America. You talk a lot about um, gender relations, and and that's kind of what I got um, just dealing with my particular area of research. Is I think people box things in so much when it comes to. Uh, femininities and masculinities and uh, the relationship between people is a common component that's left out I think um, the whole idea of homosociality um, mm -hmm. these people who and I was talking to some friends a couple of weeks ago about this how some men who are very insecure with themselves I say to myself you love other men you do. If you go, if you go to the bar with, with other guys, then you obviously love being around other men. And so, what's your problem when other men romantically wanting to be with other men, or kissing other men, or having sex with, with other men? It's it's just a weird notion to me that people would have those sorts of attitudes when they're showing that they obviously love men themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it is interesting, but it's a very common situation. If mm. if you know, being a real man is defined mm. as, you know, having sex with women, um, then, uh, but also, you, you know, uh, you, you want to live a lot of your life in the company of men in the workplace often, say, you know, the guys who are working on the um, rebuilding the house next door at the moment, they're all blokes. I mean, there, there are no women in that in that mm -hmm. uh, construction crew. Uh, so that's a homosocial group, all right. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you said, you know, uh, uh, you, you like men or love men, they might be deeply insulted because uh, they have been taught, very probably, I, I'm guessing here, um, that uh, that you don't have sexual relationships with men, even if you drink with them, work with them, spend your leisure time with them, go to the football with them, etc. You know all of this, of course. Uh, there's there's lots of ironies here. Um, I think there is a bit of a sh generational shift uh going on um in australia recently we passed a, a kind there was a kind of referendum about uh allowing uh gay couples male and female to marry each other um and and that went through with a good uh, good solid majority uh even though right-wing politicians um thought that uh, that it would uh, be defeated um, so, uh, and it's largely young people, I think, who've been driving that change. So I think there is more uh, sense of, uh, uh, among younger people of the acceptability of different gender patterns, um, including uh, different patterns of, you know, sexual relationship. Um, but um, there is also backlash, um, and you know the um, you know there are anti queer, anti trans, anti gay campaigns coming out of the political right in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just in the the states, not just in Australia, but in in quite a number of parts of the world. There is a an active backlash. Uh, going on now um, so there's there's lots of work to do uh, still in in this whole area um, I did have a few more questions I wanted to mention um, you said something about the world and this new patriarchy that could be developing in the world 
you said it in a few interviews. Um, I don't know if you um, recall the reference, but I wrote it down. You you mentioned a new patriarchy that could be developing in the world. Um, and could, could you expand on that some, what you meant by that, that you could, oh. you could see new patterns of patriarchy? Yep. Um, the, the term patriarchy, you know, is is not a happy term because it it makes us think of you know fuddy duddy old guys in <laughs> robes uh, somewhere waving bowls of incense around or something like this. And there are actually religious officials in in especially in the Orthodox churches who are actually called the patriarch. Um, but it is a term that, that was repurposed by the women's liberation movement back in the 70s uh, to mean, you know, societies that are dominated by men, where, where women are, are, you know, pushed under, so to speak. Uh, uh, so I suppose it still has, has some use uh, for, for that purpose. Um, but as I was saying before, when, when we're thinking about traditions, and as Copano Rotella has argued vigorously, um, traditions aren't fixed. Um, I mean, there are multiple traditions and, and they're always being renegotiated in the present. He has a lovely example of a gay couple in, in South Africa mm -hmm. who repurposed a traditional marriage ceremony in, in the local uh, community. Um, and, and invited, you know, a hundred or a couple of hundred friends and relatives and neighbours to this ceremony um, and, and got and married, got married. Um, so, you know, traditions can be re repurposed. They're not, they're not necessarily fixed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really important always to, to think of, you know, gender relations, gender identities, gender practices, and so forth, as not, uh, as, as never, actually, never uh, being set in an immovable mould. Mm -hmm. uh, they're always, you know, shifting, uh, complicating, finding new patterns. And therefore, I talk about the possibility of new hegemonies, um, including new patterns of hegemonic masculinity. For instance, you know, since the time of World War II, we've had computers. Um, and now we've got the internet, we've got, you know, every corporation, you know, which affects our lives is, has an intranet. Um, you know, uh, lots of people live an incredible amount of their lives on Facebook or Twitter or some other <laughs> social media. Uh, anyone who works in the academic world, you know, communicates very largely by email. Um, you know, we're, we're very much involved now with information and communication technology. Okay, if that is reshaping at the corporate world, you know, the educational world, governments, uh, and so forth, it's probably going to be reshaping gender relations too, because gender is embedded in all of those contexts. Um, so we may now be coming into a you know, um, situation where important patterns of um, patriarchal power, that is, you know, situations where men have institutionalised control, or groups of men at any rate, uh, have, have control over the major resources in the society, and we, groups of women don't, um, if that control is now embedded in computer-based systems and operated through computer-based systems um, like, like the internet, like an internet or, or like the internet, um, then, then we may have a, a, a situation where different groups of men come to the, into the central position uh, guys who don't have the same culture as those who were dominant in an earlier period uh, of history, um, who may, you know, have much more connection with uh, 
engineering and physical science and mathematics um, and who may have less you know, interest in novels and uh, that is to say, you know, uh, characters like uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, might become more, you know, the template of, of a different kind of hegemonic masculinity. Um, and that may be as oppressive as old forms, but though in different ways. Um, for instance, by surveillance through through the uh, through social media, you know, which is mm. a big issue now, mm -hmm. uh, by the manipulation of elections and public opinion, uh, which also happens through technological way measures now. We saw that in the, um, uh, we've seen that in recent elections, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's not by accident that. The Russian regime, the Chinese regime, uh, and doubtless the American regime to maintain, you know, troll farms and um, uh, you know workforces engaged in in uh, manipulation through the internet. Um, so that, that's the kind of thing that I have in mind. I, I, I'm not. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't um, really expect to be able to predict the future at least not very far <laughs> like maybe next Tuesday um, but um, and, and I would look to to novelists and you know creative artists actually for ideas about what futures there might be um, so there is some interest in science fiction for instance you know which predicts you know Societies in which robots are important, much more important than they are in ours, or or where the, the hero and the hero's best friend spend their life on the internet. You know, novels like Neuromancer, if you know that one. Um, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are different ways of peering beyond the present, and creative art is is quite important for that. What would be some advice that you would give to just anyone at the individual level, their part in improving gender relations. What would be a piece of advice that you would give just to anyone? Yeah. Uh, well, it's an old piece of advice. <laughs> Love one another. Um, and, um, and that is sometimes difficult, <laughs> of course, when people behave in a horrible way. Mm -hmm. um, but but valorizing uh, love for, uh, over hatred, um, cooperation over competition, um, finding uh, ways to share emotions and experiences. So it's about human communication. Um, and... Uh, it, it, you know, challenging privilege um, we, we, of whatever form and however it arises, whether gender privilege, racial privilege, um, economic privilege. Um, those are the things that that, that um, seem to me the 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 um, the paths forward towards a more humane world. And, and the more we move in those directions, the better chance we have um, of dealing with the, the appalling environmental crisis that we've, we've you know, collectively have produced and, and now you know, threatens the future for all of us. I think it's important that our audience realize that um, even within academia, there are these um, these struggles and hierarchies is what I would call them or hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And sure. um, I've, I've said in a couple of interviews now that I'm sort of, uh, I want to continue in academia, but I'm sort of at a crossroads when it comes to what I, exactly what I'm looking for in academia, because mm -hmm. I found that the same kind of conformity that I thought that we were supposed to speak up against is, is almost becoming a part of academic life to where we're just becoming the gatekeepers of 
regurgitating the information, you know, just on and on and on. And I thought we were supposed to be different. You know, we're supposed to be challenging the status quo, not just upholding it constantly, it seems. Um, I don't know how things are in Australia when it comes to um, the political world intertwined with the academic world. Is it any different there as it is here in the United States? Because in the United States, it's very much tied into um, the two-party system. It's tied into the whole academic Culture thing. wars. Yeah, the mm. culture wars, yep. Yep. Um, look, it's, it, it's not as intense. I think the conflicts are not as intense in Australia. Uh, as in the United States, but they are along the same lines. And um, <clears throat> one reason for that, of course, is that Australians look to the United States often for models uh, in politics and, and in culture. Um, so uh, whatever you do in the States uh, will reverberate in, in Australia <laughs> too. Um, yeah, um, I... I I have a view as to what's happened in, in academia. I've actually written a book about it uh, called The Good University. The Good um, University, okay. Yep, uh, which, which actually, yeah, one, one part of it is talking about bad universities too. But one <laughs> part of it uh, tells the story of many experiments in trying to create good, good universities and some of them, you know, post anti-colonial universities, some of them associated with radical movements. Um, and uh, and that there is a kind of hidden history of the academic world, which, which I think we ought to know more about, because uh, some of that is very exciting and, and hopeful. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, one of the things that's gone wrong uh, with, with academia uh, globally um, is that academic work, like work in other sectors of the economy, has become more precarious. Uh, so there are more people hired on short-term contracts or no contracts at all. Mm. Um, more and more teaching is done by um, what we in Australia call casuals, which sounds like, you know, they turn up in flip-flops and beach shirts, but it doesn't mean that. It means that they haven't got a contract. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have any tenure. Um, right. And that's happening around the world. So if the uh, you, much of your workforce in the academic side of the university is, is untenured and precarious, and much of your workforce in the non-academic half of the university workforce, that is the, you know, the janitors, the tech people, the professionals, the support, the secretarial people and so forth, who, who, who are necessary to make universities work. Um, much of that work is now outsourced, which means it's also very precarious. Um, you know, the more precarious the, the all your workforce is, the more pressure there'll be on them to be to be conformist, not to step out of line. Because uh, it's when you're in a you know, secure job that it's it's easier to take a stand to uh, mm. to stand up and say, you know, I'm going to say what I think uh, or what I know, whether or not it offends the managers. Um, whether or not it offends the boss. Um, so that that has been happening in universities, and I really regret that. Uh, I think it's a, a sad uh, development, and uh, because I share your view of what a university is for, that's where the creative thinking should be concentrated, where people should be constantly going beyond the immediately given. Um, beyond what we already know uh, and exploring new ideas, some of which will be good, some of which will be bad. You only find that out by trying them out. That's what experimentation is, what science is supposed to be. Um, and, and that applies to the social sciences as much as it does to the, to the natural sciences. So the universities are in a bit of trouble now. Um, but there's a lot of people also who are aware of that and trying to do something about it. 
And I, when I'm talking to, to younger people, you know, in, in universities here or, or sometimes online overseas, uh, I always say, you know, there, there's an old, old lesson of for a workforce that's struggling against bad employment conditions, and that is do it together. You know, solidarity really, really matters. Um, so join your union. Um, you know, uh, don't don't try and solve these problems individually. You know, build friendships, build networks, work collectively. That's the only way you will make project and pro progress in in the face of of this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every academic has their own line of thought and their own projects. Fine, that's fine. Um, but changing the situation that you're in has to be a collective thing to do. Um, so the more you do it together, the more chance you have of actually making progress. I appreciate you answering that question. I've posed it to a few professors I've had on the show. And um, just because I think it's an important sentiment, because, and it also um, demysticizes all these um, ideas that we have a certain type of life. And um, that's a lot of tension in academia. And, and it's not yes. really broadcast a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, and it's and we also have a lot of um, ego problems, I think, too. And that's kind of the reason why I created this program was to sort of bridge the gap between academia and yeah. uh, non-academia. Well, that's great. I mean, the more you that universities, um, you know, start to look like corporations, the more they try to control the news about themselves. So mm -hmm. you know, they they, they put out. Um, you know, ad advertisements, uh, they make media releases, they have websites and so forth. And on all of those things, you know, everyone's smiling and looking happy. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they go on doing this, even when the workforce is on strike, for God's sake. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, you never hear it from, from the official uh, website. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've carried the banner on, on the picket line at my university and looked at the university's news releases to see what's what they're saying about the situation. The answer is nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. They're carrying on as if, as if there wasn't a, a, you know, a legal industrial dispute going on at all. Uh, so, yeah, the, the news that gets out um, is pretty selective. <laughs> and I think it is quite important the kind of thing that you're trying to do, you know, to bring the experience of people in the university world together with the experience of people in other worlds and and see what's common or what's what's useful, usefully exchanged. Yeah, that's a great thing to do. Well, thank you so much. Are there any final words that you have um, for my audience? I also want the audience to kind of, um, they should know how to get to you if, if they have questions, but... I always ask this question to my guest if, if a viewer wanted to ask you a question directly, what would be the quickest way to get in touch with you? Uh, the quickest way would be to send me an email. Um, and uh, I'm uh, raywin.connell uh, at sydney.edu.au. Uh, that's raywin, R A E W Y N dot C O W -N, N E W -L, L. Uh, so you can reach me through my university. I have a website also, which is... Um, it's a beautiful website, uh, by the way. I love that Oh, website. thank you. Yeah, it thank is. You. It's very nice, yeah. Um, it's it's ravenconnell.net. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to people whenever I can. Yes, I'll link um, your web, your official site, uh, onto the episode description um, cool. after we conclude the interview so people can can get... I don't know if my audience is actually clicking on the links. I hope they are. I tell them all the time there's so much information that I'd like to embed within the episode description, so hopefully my audience is getting the benefit of the information. Um, sure. I've had a pleasure of talking with you, and I think 
when I get people like yourself on the program, some other people, I won't mention their names because I'm very close to them, but they've, they've been sort of reluctant to get on the show because they want to test the waters and see who else is on the show. And I'm like, come on, it's a safe space. This is an encouraging environment. This is all about knowledge and learning, learning and bringing people together. So hopefully after they watch these programs coming out and they've seen Ray McConnell, um, they will also be more likely to join the show and, and express their ideas as well. Okay, well, best of luck. Thank you so much for accepting that invitation. I had a pleasure of talking with you and I can't wait to listen to the episode myself afterwards. Beautiful people, enjoy your nights and people in Sydney, enjoy your afternoons. We will talk soon. Cheers.